This is a psalm of meditation. David is talking to himself and talking as well to God and about God. And the psalm is set by, or understood better, by some words that are given and repeated throughout the psalm. So if we can have the key thought, thank you. There's a personal blessing. Notice how the psalm begins. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And that thought is repeated again in the next verse and repeated also at the end of the psalm. David is thinking about who God is and what God is like. So he's reflecting on God and his character. And if you'll notice, all the psalms that are given at the bottom of the screen that are devoted particularly to worship. These are what's called, or what called worship psalms. And if you'll notice in the beginning, or right here, Hallel Psalms, 113, 118, all of those psalms are about worship. Now, why is worship important? Go off screen just a minute. Worship is important because we are self-oriented creatures. We think about ourselves first and primarily. When you worry, most of the time you're worrying about something related to you or to your family or to your state of being. When you're angry, you're usually angry about something that happened to you or something somebody did to you. And when you're depressed, you're thinking about something that you are facing that you don't like. Could be a health problem, could be money problems, could be a relationship problem. There are all sorts of issues that play into depression. Depression is a big part of human existence. Some people struggle more than others. Now, I want us to notice some of the key words in this psalm. So, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. The word Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, in the Hebrew language is the covenant name of God. If you remember when Moses was in the desert, he went to a burning bush. And God then told him to go deliver Moses, to deliver the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said, well, who am I going to say that sent me? And there God gives what's known as his covenant name for the first time in Scripture. And the Y means I, the H means am, the V means that, and of course you have another H which is I am that I am. We transliterate it to Jehovah. If you were Hebrew, you would say Yahweh. The W in the Hebrew language is like a V in our language. So this particular name of God is mentioned in this one psalm ten times. And is God's way of revealing to David as David meditates on him and as the Spirit guides him in his thinking to write down these words that we have, God is teaching David what he's teaching you and me today, and that is he wants a relationship with us. He's a God of relationships. What happened when God created Adam and Eve? He visited with them. He talked with them. He communed with them. And when they sinned and departed from his presence, what did he do? Now, he's omniscient. So remember, when he says, Adam, where are you? He knows exactly where he is. But he's saying in the same way we would say to somebody that we miss, somebody that passed away or somebody that moved away, where are you? You were once part of my life. You were once important to me, and now you're gone. And that's the kind of thing that can cause us to move into depression, discouragement, or disheartenment. 
The second set of words that's repeated again and again have to do with pronouns relating to God, his, he, him, who, 28 times. So 38 different times in this short little psalm of 22 verses, God, David talks about God, and he's focused on God, and he wants to understand who God is. Do you remember, some of you may have to go back to the Stone Age for this, but you remember when you were dating? You remember how you wanted to know everything there was to know about that person? And you asked questions, you wrote letters, today you would text, or you would do some other form of social media. We long for relationships. Not only are we characteristically self-oriented, we are also characteristically relationship-oriented. When Adam and Eve were in that situation right before uh, God dealt with them, God said something very significant. He said, it is good, not good that man should be alone. And he said, provided a help meet for them, for Adam, and that help meet was Eve, made from his side. So we all long for companionship. And this psalm shows us how to have a relationship with God. So that's the purpose of these pronouns. You, your, us, me, my, all those 17 times. A psalm about man and his relationship with God through worship. And that's the theme. If worship is important to God, the theme. If worship is important to God, it should be important to you and me. And I need to start now to tell you what I mean by worship. Worship is when you turn your thoughts away from everything else and focus them on God. And you surrender your will away from everything else and you surrender it to God. And you surrender your emotions. You take your emotions away from everything else and you focus them, your emotions, on God. Man is created in God's image. God has a mind with which he thinks. He has a will by which he acts. And he has emotions by which he perfectly loves. And so created in God's image, God wants us to turn our minds and our hearts and our will toward him. And sadly, most of us only get to the mind part. We think about God from time to time. You may read the Bible, but when you read the Bible, does it ever affect you emotionally? Do you ever weep when you read Scripture? That's a good thing. The Bible also teaches us to move on God's behalf, to do what God wants uh, us to do. So to will, when we worship, you can actually worship God by singing. You can worship God by setting up chairs. You can worship God by greeting people at the door. In fact, in the New Testament, the word translated worship is also translated service. So worship is just not sitting around in your room and and swaying and singing and, and thinking about holy thoughts. It is something that takes up your whole person. So let's go now to the psalm itself. Angels, by the way, praise God 24 hours, seven days a week, as you saw a minute ago. And that's what you and I will do throughout eternity. Bless the Lord, O my soul. How much do you talk to yourself? Hopefully not out loud. But all the time, we're, and you're doing it right now, you're talking to yourself. You may be saying things like, 
who I really don't like that Cody's wearing. Or you may be saying things like, um, sure is warm in here. Or you could be thinking, man, I th- and I do this sometimes, and it really bothers me that I do it. But I sit in church, and I think, now, what am I going to have for lunch today? I start thinking about the restaurants that I'll be going to after I, after I go to church. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Don't you love to see people that are all in? They're excited. That's why sports are so popular. When you watch a, a game, a ball game, football game, football is a big thing now. And by the way, I was in Kansas City this past week. And if you don't think can't, football is big in Kansas City, you need to go. Red was everywhere. Red hats, Kansas City Chiefs. They're going to be in the Super Bowl soon. So they're just pumped that their team is in the Super Bowl. But one of the great reasons we're so attracted to sports is because we're seeing people that are all in, playing with all their heart, giving it everything they've got. And and that excites us. When you see a guy run down the field and reach out his arms and catch a ball some 30, 40 yards away from the quarterback, it's exciting. Or if you see the guy standing three quarters away back on a basketball court and you see him take that shot and it just goes, misses rim and everything, all net, that excites you. And the stands, the people in the stands cheer and yell and cry out, yay! You ever do that to God? Uh, hopefully, again, privately. But you ever get everything you have, every emotion in you, every part of your being. One of the reasons that I asked Bob to sing the song that we did, go to YouTube and look that song up, that song up, not now, but later. And notice how the people that are singing that song are immersed in worship. And we can express ourselves different ways. How you do that is not the main thing. The main thing is heart, mind, will. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And and bless means to praise or to honor or to extol or to lift up. Now, he's going to get the benefits of, of, of praising God, of worship, beginning with verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. When God was dealing with the Israelites early on in their journey, he said to them in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 10 through 14, I believe we have that on the next slide, When you have eaten and are full, then shall you, what would we do? Go on our way, do the next thing, you know. But he says, bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Most of us love food, and most of us are grateful when we have good food. And so when somebody makes something particularly good tasting, we bless them. We say thank you. Really appreciate that. That was really good. Really enjoyed that. And that's part of worship. That's not worship in the sense that I'm preaching now, but it's an it's a expression of praise, adoration, thanksgiving. How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? What would you think? Probably words like, wow, or you're a little younger, amazing, unbelievable. You stand there and you look at the beauty of that place, and it creates a sense of wonder. One of my favorite songs is How Great Thou Art. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. 
It's, it's really based a lot on Psalm 19. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe is displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art! How great thou art! Worship. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments. His judgments and his statutes, which I command you this day, lest when you have eaten and you are full and have built beautiful houses, does that describe us today? Dwell in them when your herds and flocks multiply, your silver and gold are multiplied. All that you have is multiplied when your heart becomes proud and lifted up and you forget. What is the curse of the United States today? We have forgotten God. And we are bearing the fruit of a nation that forgets God. When a people as a whole forget God, they turn to themselves, they become gods. And I'll touch on it, so, and I want to be compassionate in the way that I touch on it. When people worship themselves, they become immoral. They're no longer committed to a person, a wife, or a husband, or children. They're committed to themselves. And everything becomes about me and what I want and what I need. Have you been disheartened by the price gouging that's going on in our nation today? Have you noticed that things are almost twice as much as they were two years ago? That's the idolatry of this nation. It's all about money. How much can we get from people? So he said, when you forget God, that's, that's what happens. The first is to Remember, the importance of remembering his benefits in verse 2. He forgives your sin, verse 3. He ultimately heals your diseases, second part, verse 3. He redeems your life from destruction, verse 4. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Also, verse 4, he satisfies your mouth with good things, renews your strength day by day, executes righteousness and judgment for all that are pressed. He made, ways, his known, made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. So first... To remember, secondly, he forgives sin. As a pastor, one of the heartbreaks in pastoral ministry was to see how family members did not forgive family members. And one family member could do something or say something or behave in a certain way, and the whole family disintegrates. Just saw an example of that just recently in a family close to us. And of all the things that we need to do when we worship is to go to God and say, Now, Lord, who do I need to forgive? Think of the Lord's Prayer. When you come to God in prayer, do a self-examination and ask yourself, Is there anybody that I have not forgiven that I need to forgive? And if somebody's come to your head right now, you need to say right now where you are, Lord, give me the grace to forgive him. You do not want to become a bitter person. Who forgives all your iniquities. Jeremiah 31, 34. They shall teach no man, no more every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. Here's forgiveness. Choosing, willing not to remember. It's impossible to forget. But it is possible to will, to choose, not to remember what that person did to you. So when you forgive them and they come around you, you aren't thinking about what they did to you. You're thinking about how can I help them? How can I be a blessing to them? How can I encourage them? How can I minister to them? He forgives sin. 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light, as he in the light, we have fellowship with another, blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from 
all sin. Secondly, he ultimately heals and delivers, who heals all your diseases. Obviously, you're going to get sick. And sometimes God chooses not to heal that sickness. So when he says heals all your diseases, this is not, this is not the atonement kind of healing. This is the healing where, where people teach that God is obligated to, forget, to, to heal you. That's, that's a type of teaching that comes from verses like this. He's not saying that. He's saying, let's keep reading because the context is going to help you see what he's saying who heals all your diseases, who redeems, saves, buys back your life from destruction, who encircles, crowns you with loving kindness, that's covenant loyalty, that goes back to that name of God, and tender mercies. And that's a tender concern, compassion. So what God does is that he heals all these diseases, maybe not physically because that's not the important thing with us. Our bodies are not the important part of us, even though we think they are. The important part of us is our spirit, our soul, who we are before God. That's what's going to endure forever. Your body's going to die. It's dying now. You have eggs today you didn't have later. And let me tell you, whoever said that the senior years of the golden years was lying through their teeth, <laughs> they are not the golden years. Your body deteriorates, your mind deteriorates, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is who I am. And this takes a lot of work. I am working not to be a grumpy old man. My natural disposition is to be a dump, grumpy old man. But I'm, I want God to heal me of all those things that come with age. Impatience, self-preoccupation, thinking you know more than other people. Just all those things that can come with age. So healing is part of the redemptive work that God does. He surrounds us with loving kindness and tender mercies, and he satisfies. Verse 5, who satisfies your mouth with good things. Let me ask you a question. Satisfied right now? Satisfied with what God has given you? Are you satisfied with your house? Our kitchen sink is not working right now, and it's kind of hard for me to be satisfied. But guess what? There are more important things than a kitchen sink, aren't there? So you focus on God, and you focus on who he is and what he's done, his benefits. He forgives, he heals, he redeems, he crowns, surrounds you with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfies your mouth with good things. He gives us good things to eat, gives us a sense of taste, enables us to enjoy them. Now, David is going to turn away from what God does to who he is, his attributes. And he starts thinking about God and who God is and what God does. And he says in verse 6, the Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I get really angry sometimes when I see the way people treat each other people, other people, treat each other. It really makes me angry in my heart to see a child abused, to see people take advantage of one another, see how mean they are to each other, and it makes you want to do something about it. In most cases, we can't do anything, but we can do this. We can trust that God is going to execute justice to all who are oppressed, that God can take care of that child, that God will help that 
older person who's being abused by their caregiver, that God can help people in Israel, that part of the world, God can help people in the Ukraine. So he not only gives us all this, he is righteous. Absolutely right in all he does or thinks. No error, no blemish, no shortcoming, no failure in God. He is right, he does right. He is always right. Now, some of us think we're always right, but we're not. Only God is always right. He is self-revealing. He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. You see a prayer early on. Moses prays, and he says, Now for that I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me your way, good prayer, that I may know you and find grace in your sight. So God responds in chapter 34, verses 6 through 7. Next slide. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Now watch how much of what God said here in 34, 6 through 7. He said to David, or David has said in his psalm, in Psalm 103. So kind of look, look at that and, and compare that to what we've seen so far and what we will see. The Lord God, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So God is not only righteous, he is self-revealing. He teaches you who he is through his word. The Bible likens itself to food. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Let me encourage you to do something. Actually, two things, but they're part one of another. When you read the Bible, tempted to ask, I'm, I don't want to do this, but I'm tempted to ask how many of you are reading through the Bible this year, because it's a good thing. I'm doing it again for the first time in a while, and I wish I'd been doing it before, but it's a good thing. When you read through the Bible... Stop and ask yourself, what does this mean to me? And then if you see a verse that you really like, memorize it. Put it on a card somehow, write it down, figure out some way so you can take it with you wherever you go. And when you're standing in line at Walmart, instead of thinking how aggravated you are over that person who just bought 30 bottles of of whatever. Look at the verse. Think about it. Don't necessarily recommend that when you're driving down the road, but certainly when you're walking from place to place, wherever you go. The Bible talks about Deuteronomy 6, wherever you go, think and consider teach your children. He is righteous. He is self-revealing. By the way, so read, memorize, meditate. Those three. He is merciful. I, I grew up in a pretty merciless home. My dad was a man of law. He was not a sheriff or a guy. He's actually a postal worker, but I often thought, hmm, raised by a postal employee. He never got out the guns, but he was this kind of guy. Do it now. Why? Because I said so. And sometimes a why might be accompanied by a physical reminder. So I grew up in a home where there was not a lot of mercy. And I've had to learn mercy from God and my wife. I've learned that I need to be like God and not take people's offenses personally. I should not. I don't need to think about myself when people respond to me in a bad way. If they don't look at me or if they don't talk to me or if they don't meet a need or if they say something I don't like or do something I don't like, God is merciful. The Lord is merciful. This word means compassionate. He's gracious. It means he's easy. He's smooth. Slow to anger. 
abounding in mercy. This second word means compassionate. He is by nature merciful. He responds to weakness with plenteous mercy. He is slow to anger. Let me ask you this question, especially your parents. Are you slow to anger? You know what will hurt your children as much as, as child abuse? In fact, it's a form of child abuse. Anger. Angry people raise angry children. They learn it. And they learn instead of listening and thinking to hit. And they learn instead of being kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God has forgiven you, they learn to lash out and rail out and hurt and wound and destroy, which is what anger does. God is slow to anger. He is merciful. He is patient. He will not always strive with us. Neither will he keep, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward us. So he's saying that there's going to come a time when you will be judged for your sin. It may be in this life, or it may be in the life to come. He does not always strive, nor will he keep his anger forever. But you can count on, while you're in this life, God is going to be merciful to you. <coughs> He's going to be kind. He's going to be gracious. He's going to be compassionate. As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy towards them that fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, how far is that? Infinity, immeasurable. There is no measurable distance between the east and the west. One writer said, however many miles you may think lie between west and east, you cannot look two ways at once. You have to turn your back on one in order to look in the direction of the other. When God forgives us, he puts our sins uh, behind him and, and looks in, and on two different horizons. So when he looks at our sin, he is no longer looking at us. And when he looks at us, he's no longer looking at our sin. To use the vocabulary of Paul, God has justified us. He is also gracious. As a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him, those that fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers we are dust. How valuable is dust? What do you do with dust? Try to get rid of it. But he said he doesn't do that. He remembers that we're dust, but he doesn't get rid of us like we get rid of dust. He keeps us. He helps us. He forgives us. He understands us. Let me encourage you to think about something. Some of you are dealing with some really hard sins. Anger may be one. Drinking could be another one. Drugs could be a third. Cussing. There are all kinds of things that people deal with. Can I ask you to remember that God is gracious? He knows who you are. Now, I'm not saying, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying keep doing what you're doing. I'm saying learn to accept forgiveness in your own heart. Learn that as God forgives you, you need to forgive yourself. You need to let it go and ask God to give you the power not to keep on doing it. That last phrase is really important. He is sovereign. Next slide. He's gracious, his father, pities his children. Let's keep going. This is the uh, verses that I just read, so let's do the next slide. David ends this psalm by remembering some things about God that he wants us to remember. He rules over all. The Lord has established his throne in the kingdom and his king, uh, in the heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Now, I'm not sure I understand the next several verses. It looks like there are hierarchies of angels. 
this host, whoever they are, is it angels, angelic beings, or is it human beings? I don't know that I know, but I know this. Angels bless him. Bless the Lord, all you as angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his commandments. Excuse me. Bless the Lord, all ye his host, ye ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Can we say this together? Bless the Lord, O my soul. One more time. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. So let's, let's sum up. Next slide. Is there a priority for worship or praise in your heart? So this is what we've learned from this psalm. One, meditate upon God's benefits instead of your problems. Consciously do that. When you start thinking about your back hurting or you start thinking about something that your child has done that you wish they hadn't done, or you think about your parent, your father, your mother, who may not have been as nice to you as you would like for them to have been. Or you think about some failure in your own life. Meditate on God and on his benefits. Go to this psalm and you remind yourself what this psalm teaches. Secondly, count your blessings, not your challenges. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Meditate upon God's attributes and not your frailties. And then lastly, consider that God is sovereign over all, he rules over all, ultimately would be praised by all. None of us like what's happening in this world with evil abounding. We don't like to see children suffer because of their parents. When we pass by these tent cities that you see, your little tent gatherings that you see in Wilmington from time to time in other cities, you can either think compassionate thoughts toward those people or you can think judgmental thoughts, hard thoughts ungodlike thoughts. How do you help somebody like that? I don't know. But let me caution you. I don't know that money's going to fix their problem. So if you give them money, where is it going to go and what's it going to do? But you can give them food. You can give them clothes. And thank you for, I've been wanting to go to this thing that you guys do. Was it last Saturday? It just hasn't worked, but I'm going to get there. So sometime. We'll get there. This helping people have food, that's such a great thing. But meditate on God's business, benefits. Count your blessings. Meditate on God's attributes. Remember that he rules over all. He'll eventually be praised by all. Let's bow our heads together. How important is worship to you? How often do you worship in spirit and in truth? You know, it's easy to come to church out of habit. It's relatively easy to listen without ever really hearing. It's easy to do things, but it's much harder to surrender and yield yourself to God and focus on Him and let Him him be all that you are. And just take some time every day. And make that time about God. Listening to him, loving him, giving your heart to him, giving your mind to him, surrendering your will to him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in light of his glory and 
His grace. I want to quote this song and then we'll close in prayer. The nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall. There is still one God reigning over all. So I will not fear, for this truth remains, that God is the ancient of days. None above him, none before him, all time in his hands. For his throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in his name. For my God is the ancient of days. Though the dread of night overwhelms my soul, he is here with me, I'm not alone. Oh, his love is sure, he knows my name. My God, the ancient of days. Though I may not see what the future holds, I will watch and wait for the Savior King. Then my joy complete, standing face to face in the presence of the ancient of days. Bob, if you'll come, close this out, please. Thank you, Brother Mike. I hope that we will take this to heart because worship is something that we all do automatically every day. We're worshiping something or someone. Sometimes it's ourselves. But we were made to worship God. So I'm going to be quiet for a few seconds and close this in prayer, but I would encourage you to ask God, are there ways in which I am not worshiping you? Are there changes I need to make right now in my heart or in my actions this week so that I am worshiping you? You talk to God right now, and then I'll close this in prayer. Our Lord, you have said that we are to be living sacrifices set apart for you. that seeing ourselves as your servant is reasonable service. And Lord, that's an act of worship. So Father, whether it's in our own times of personal devotions, reading our Bible, praying, singing, whether it's these times when we come together as a church family and hear from your word and pray together and sing your praises together, May our focus not be on ourselves. May our focus not be on what we like or don't like. May our focus be on you. Lord, may we lift up our eyes today and see you, that you would be high and lifted up. That we acknowledge that you are God, you are good, you are holy, you are righteous that we would pray these thoughts along with the psalmist, praising you for who you are, for what you've done, that that would be in our hearts, that that would be in our minds, that that would be in our actions today and this week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.